As I mentioned, this panel will be um, moderated by, by Don Elliott, who has achieved great things in life and is now on the Yale faculty and at the Covington and Burling Law Firm. But for me, he will always be my environmental law professor from my 2L year in, in law school. Uh, and he's been, for the last 10 years, a chair of the Policy Integrity Advisory Board. So Don will introduce Cass. Cass will speak. Don will ask some questions. We'll get questions on the floor. Um, get your lunch and sit down quietly. Thank you so much for joining us for this um, afternoon session. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, it's a great personal privilege for me to uh, share the podium with Cass Sunstein. Uh, Cass and I were junior faculty members together at the University of Chicago in the mid-80s mid uh, and have been friends ever since. Let me just add to what Ricky said. Uh, Cass is often identified uh, as the, the most cited law professor of his uh, generation. Ricky mentioned his productivity. He is also uh, very, very creative and the most influential and I would say the most thoughtful law professor of his uh, generation. It pains me that he is a professor of law at the Harvard Law School rather than the Yale Law School, uh, but it's a, it's a great privilege to introduce Cass. He has also been the um, administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, the so-called regulatory czar uh, under, under President Obama. And Cass will speak, as he usually does, on whatever he wants to. Okay, so uh, it's a complete thrill to be here. I see uh, many friends and colleagues and uh, people I worked with in the government who were astonishing and inspiring and people from whose work in the government and the private sector, and yes, I'm looking at you, Sally Katzen, as a, a beacon for us, and my teacher, Dick Stewart, who got me started on all this. So uh, it's fantastic to be here. And the thing I want to put in bold letters is that what Ricky Revez has done with the Institute is phenomenal, and it has had a major impact on what governments do, as well as moving the intellectual ball forward, and that's a, that's a pretty neat trick. Um, if I have one thing to say in these remarks, and I'm going to say something about a frontiers issue that uh, is uh, obsessing me, it's that we often think that the issues that divide us are issues of values, but the fundamental divisions are involved issues of fact, not values. So in 2018, in a discussion of energy and the environment, this is not exactly a natural claim or an intuitive claim. But what I want to suggest is that immersion in the facts is often a way of quieting and more frequently than at least I would expect, a way of eliminating disagreement. And I'm going to give just three examples and then two uh, notations. Uh, in the last years, the government has struggled with debates over uh, cooling towers, regulation of cooling towers, which involves the energy, and the question is whether there are ecological benefits from regulation or high costs. Uh, regulation of mercury, which has, of course, environmental uh, hazards associated with it, as well as high costs to eliminating or significantly reducing those hazards, and uh, ozone where with respect to atmosphere, ground level as opposed to atmospheric ozone, uh, regulation could be very expensive or not, and it could produce health benefits. Uh, the Trump administration recently uh, agreed with the Obama administration's decision with respect to ozone. It said we're not going to change it, notwithstanding a political debate. And the Obama administration's very complicated set of decisions with respect to ozone, I'm here to say they were uh, something like 99 or 100 percent technical and somewhere between 0 and 1 percent political. The driver of the decision was what are the relevant facts with respect to ozone. The same is exactly true with respect to mercury where the analysis of uh, health effects and the analysis of economic adverse effects uh, was predominant in the conclusion. And once the facts were clear, the political disagreement kind of dissipated. 
With respect to cooling towers, where the environmental community has been very disappointed with what both Democratic and Republican administrations uh, sought, the most environmentalist environmentalists within the Obama administration came to agree that a relatively cautious approach was justified given uh, an understanding of the likely consequences of the rule. The mercury issue is newly controversial, but kind of surprisingly newly controversial because the technical people, at least so far as I'm aware, are in agreement that the mercury rule basically makes sense on human consequences ground. There are some interesting legal wrinkles, but the issues of value tend to get very much softer. The two notations I want to make is that our, first involves my favorite document uh, out of the US government since the Constitution. Okay, since the, since the Bill of Rights Amendments, the 14th and 13th and 15th Amendments, since the Civil War Amendments. And uh, it is the, don't laugh at me, laugh with me, uh, the, uh, the Regulatory Impact Analysis Checklist. Have you heard of the checklist? Uh, the checklist is a very short document that basically says, in multiple ways, get very clear on the facts. What are the alternatives? What do the public comments say? What are the costs and what are the benefits? What's the way of maximizing net benefits? And it's two pages. And it is basically a plea for bracketing, unless we need to, high questions of value, and by looking very determinately at what are the likely consequences of what's being done. The social cost of carbon, which is a, has been a driver of US policy with respect to energy and the environment, emerged from a spectacularly technical process in which the people in the room were politically oblivious. Some of them, I have no idea what their politics were, but what I do know is they had relevant expertise with respect to EG, uh, the adverse effects of climate change, how to think about discount rates, um, how to think about climate sensitivity. And uh, the fact that the social cost of carbon document emerged as the GAO confirmed to the surprise of many skeptics that it was an entirely apolitical process is uh, a tribute to the possibility of reaching consensus on a factual question amidst uh, what are apparently deep value disagreements. Interestingly, the Trump administration's abandonment of the longstanding social cost of carbon process involved taking on board significant parts of that analysis and just making basically two uh, departures, which suggests that the values are relevant, but many of the technical judgments are in place. Okay, I'm gonna talk about something that is uh, a little specific, more specific than what I've just said. And it does involve, I think, a possible way forward for handling some currently blocked energy and environment challenges. And it involves information disclosure as a way of triggering two things. One is a consumer's economic self-interest, and another is consumer's moral conscience. And the idea is that with respect to many um, problems, including the climate problem, including the air pollution problem, a relatively cautious and often agreeable way forward is to require information to be, to be disclosed so as to trigger either consumer or citizen uh, action corresponding to the judgments that they themselves make. The challenge that I want to put my finger on is one that I failed to meet in my time in government, uh, which is the challenge of doing cost-benefit analysis with respect to information disclosure. So I want, what I want to put on the agenda here is uh, the potential value of information disclosure as a partial response to problems and also the difficulty and necessity of getting clear on costs and benefits. So the broad scope uh, of what I'm discussing now should be clear. Uh, in the domain of fuel economy, energy efficiency, dolphin safe tuna, genetically modified organisms, the government has been keenly interested and frequently mandated disclosure. 
But what we're observing in the public sector, and I believe this is true of the private sector also, is the black hole of federal regulatory policy or the Finnegan's Wake of federal regulatory policy. James Joyce wrote many novels, many considering how long and complicated they were, and one of them is incomprehensible. It's called Finnegan's Wake. This is the Finnegan's Wake of regulatory policy. And what I want to identify with the hope that this will trigger thinking about many energy and environment challenges, not just information disclosure, is the potential of four different approaches and to suggest the uh, imperfections of each, though I'm going to declare one a winner. Okay, the first approach is to say we have no idea what the benefits of a disclosure policy are. And if that seems pathetic, uh, it is, but it's also honest in some cases where, for example, you're imposing fuel economy labels on the nation's motor vehicles, partly with the goal of reducing air pollution, and you just don't know what the consumer response will be. And if you know what the consumer response will be, you're not clear how to turn it into monetary equivalents. Now, for the US government, the major challenge for fuel economy labels is the first, figure out what the consumer response will be. And rather than make up a number, and so this is credit to the, uh, the regulators, the government said, we just don't know. And that's uh, fair, but it is um, terrible to impose a significant cost on the private sector and to declare to the nation's citizens, we have no idea what the benefits are. To make it a little more concrete, the Trump administration recently proposed a GMO labeling rule where the costs in the first year may be as high as $3.5 billion. That's the upper bound. That's a monster rule. The Trump administration said somewhere between we have no idea what the benefits are and there are no benefits. Okay, uh, this should be so 1970s as an approach to quantifying the benefits of information disclosure. We may be there, but we don't want to be in a time machine. Second approach is a little more subtle, and I hope for state and local governments, for federal regulators, and for the private sector, this is a administrable tool which has a degree of discipline in it if you are exercising, let's say, a word out of the hat, integrity. And the idea is to say, okay, we don't know what the benefits are, but if we know what the costs are, can we project what the benefits would have to be to justify the costs, and then can we say something about whether that pro projection has reality? So suppose you are mandating energy efficiency labels for refrigerators, and suppose you know it's going to cost $10 million annually, pretty inexpensive rule. Suppose you know that 8 million refrigerators are sold in the US every year. Even if the average consumer saves only a few dimes as a result of the label, the cost is going to be made up in three years. And it's very likely that the average consumer is going to save at least a few dimes every year. Probably some consumers are going to save a lot of dollars if there's an energy efficiency label on refrigerators. This is a little arithmetic exercise, but it's completely generalizable to try to figure out what, are the, what is the lower bound or upper bound on the savings, and are we likely to jump over the lower bound so we can declare victory on cost-benefit grounds, or likely to fall short of the upper bound in which case we should declare failure on cost-benefit grounds and not go through. So my plea is to think that rather than who knows the EPA's approach to fuel economy labels, it ought to have done a break-even analysis by which it could have assured the American public, perhaps, that this would be worthwhile or not. And if this seems a little academic and theoretical, my hope is that it's anything but that because it can be either a green light or a red light to a series of initiatives that are currently under contemplation. Okay, here's a third approach which the US government likes best and I'm going to um, have a, a lot of ambivalence about it. 
the approach that the US government likes best is to say, what are the health or economic endpoints that we are likely to be able to get from an initiative? So if you have an initiative, let's say, that is going to make the air cleaner, we hope, as a result of disclosing something about energy efficiency of appliances, what is the air quality improvement going to be? And what are the economic savings going to be? Add them up, and that's it. That's the benefit. And I thought, when I was working in the government, I thought, some days, that's perfect. At least if we have the information. Once we have the endpoints or a range, lower bound and upper bound, then we know what the benefits are. And often it's going to look really good, and sometimes it's going to look really bad, but at least we know what we're doing. And remember the checklist? We will have complied with the checklist. Okay, I'm no longer so excited about health endpoints, and here's uh, why. If you give consumers information, the health endpoints or the, or the economic endpoints aren't going to capture the full benefits of the thing. Because if you give people information, it will sometimes make them sadder. It will sometimes make them busier. It will sometimes make them do something that they don't want to do, but now they think they kind of have to. Or it will sometimes get people to keep doing what they were doing, but feel, I'm a jerk, or I'm stupid. If that seems abstract, I want to make it clear by the only empirical study there is on this issue, and it is blissfully right in the domain of energy and the environment. It involves O-Power's ingenious effort to save money and protect the environment by telling consumers through a home energy report how their energy use compares to that of their peers. That idea about using peer behavior as a nudge toward externality reduction and money savings, it's a fantastic idea, and uh, it deserves you know, some kind of prize. Uh, here's the trick. What is the benefit socially of what O-Power is doing? We know that the average consumer saves, I'm going to make up a number, but it's ballpark, $8 a year. We know also there's an externality reduction. I'm going to make up a number. It's $4 a year. If we multiply 12 times the number of consumers who get the report, do we have the benefit? On what I suggested is the government's preferred approach, health and economic endpoints, we're there. But here's what the study did. It asked consumers, how much are you willing to pay to get the home energy report? And they did not say $8. They said something like $3. Now, if the study worked well, it's not that people answering the question were silly. It's that they thought, OK, I'm going to save $8, but I'm going to have to think about energy reduction. I'm going to have to take other steps. I'm not going to have a lot of fun doing those steps. And the benefit to me of the home energy report is less than half the economic benefit to me of the home energy report. This is um, not the most uh, happy-making point. But it's really important, and I'll give you a little story that will drive it home. When I was in the government, I was um, very enthusiastic about menu labeling, calorie labeling for chain restaurants. And we were cautious in our proposal about extending it to movie theaters on the ground, empirical ground. We didn't know the data in terms of the costs and benefits of extending it to movie theaters. But a group of us said, let's tee it up as, a as an alternative to our proposal so we get information in from the public. And if information comes in from the public that suggests it's a good idea, we'll be in a position to do it. After I left the government, the decision was to include movie theaters on the ground that the data did justify it, facts, not values. The Trump administration, by the way, recently reaffirmed this rule also. And um, I was very excited. I was, had a private sector email. I sent to my wife, Samantha Power, a note saying, hooray, the rule is finalized and includes movie theaters. And she sent me a note with three words back, Cass ruined popcorn. 
Now, what made that a brilliant note was she was capturing the fact that the economic or health endpoints are not capturing the full effects of the thing. Popcorn's less wonderful if you know it has 1,000 calories. This is not to say that the home energy report is a bad idea. It's still justified, it turns out. It happens to be. But it, but it suggests that the specification of health and economic endpoints does, doesn't tell us what it's worth. OK, um, let me tell you something about uh, willingness to pay as an alternative measure. The willingness to pay measure, which is used in the study I just described, is on happy assumptions preferred. It's the best approach. So cards on the table, willingness to pay is better than saying nothing. Willingness to say nothing is worse than break-even analysis. Break-even analysis is worse than willingness to pay. Willingness to pay is better than health and economic endpoints. The problem is that for environmental goods in particular, it's very challenging for consumers to come up with a willingness to pay that is sufficiently informed and behaviorally unbiased so that we can trust it. Go back to the home energy report or think about a fuel economy label or anything that you have in mind that's an that's a information disclosure approach. Consumers need a lot of information to know how much to pay for information. And Ken, Kenneth Arrow saw this about 40 years ago, saying they need to be informed such that they have the information. And any information you give may bias them in an unfortunate way. Even if you inform people about the benefits and can overcome that difficulty, if people are focused on the short term rather than the long term, which is a human tendency, the future is often a foreign country, later land, and we're not sure we're ever going to visit which is a real challenge for energy policy for long-term <laughs> adverse effects. People may think, OK, I'm going to make money or get my health better, but that's 20 years in the future. And uh, what is uh, it worth now? Okay, that suggests that for willingness to pay to work, we have to overcome these challenges. And that may be really hard to do. Okay, what's the best way forward for government? Uh, silence is not a good idea. Break-even analysis is much better in the face of informational deficits. If you can come up with health or economic endpoints, that's better than break-even analysis because it's hard and it's real. It's health or it's money. To consider that as an upper bound on the aggregate benefits, that's a good idea. Willingness to pay is better still, but we have to be very careful uh, with the uh, risk that people's stated willingness to pay is either going to suffer from a behavioral bias or an informational deficit. I think I'll end with just two points. One is, uh, notwithstanding the detail, you should take these remarks as being extremely bullish about information disclosure as a response to energy and environmental challenges, both because it activates consumer self-interest and because it activates moral conscience. For those who are willing to act in accordance with it. And the second is it's essential uh, to do uh, a disciplined analysis of costs and benefits to the extent that you can and to have that be the driver of policy conclusions rather than seeing costs and benefits as a fortunate tool which frequently will uh, be supportive of a policy conclusion reached on other grounds. That is to say that the bedrock ought to be something like policy integrity. Thanks. Well, Cass, thank you for uh, those very thoughtful and provocative uh, remarks. You certainly lived up to my praise mm -hmm. of you in my uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions, but, but while I do, uh, we'd like you to uh, write out questions and pass them to those who are uh, passing, th passing uh, along the, uh, the sides so we can get some questions from the audience for, for Cass. Um, I wanted to start, Cass, by, by asking a question about willingness to pay. Uh, I think the, the scope of your, your talk was basically limited to government mandating um, uh, information disclosure, 
And I, I wanted to ask why, if you think willingness to pay is the appropriate criterion, why, why won't um, meta markets or intermediaries provide the information that consumers want? Having, uh, having read some of your books, I can anticipate your answers, but rather than anticipate them, I thought I'd let you answer and, and then we can talk about it. But why, why should the government be in the business of mandating information disclosure at all? It's a completely fair question. You uh, might think that we're going to get the information that consumers want, and we often do with respect to risks and such without any government mandate. But the, both the kind of standard neoclassical problem and the uh, behavioral problems uh, kick in. So think about the question whether there should be disclosure of risks and let's say, uh, failures on the part of uh, sunscreens, uh, where let's suppose some of them cause health risks and some of them don't work in helping you avoid the risk of skin cancer. Uh, what does the consumer demand? The consumers don't know. So the consumers aren't going to be demanding the information, and people can't make money from providing it. Now, on one account, the producers will then start saying, my uh, sunscreen works and will prevent you from getting cancer and others won't or someone is going to provide that information. But there are technical economic reasons where that might not happen. If that, suppose the producer can solve the market problem, there's still behavioral biases. It might be there's an absence of attention. It might be there's unrealistic optimism. 90% of drivers think they're safer than the average driver. Uh, smokers are well aware of the risks of smoking, but in one study by some very good people, smokers believe that they themselves were less at risk of lung cancer and heart disease than the average non-smoker. So statistical knowledge with the belief in personal immunity, and then there's present bias. And information can be designed in such a way as to overcome those things. It's also possible that some information disclosure, especially in the environmental area, is designed to uh, reduce externalities. And while corrective taxes are the preferred approach, sometimes they're not feasible, and markets aren't going to generate information to correct externalities, just as markets aren't going to generate corrective taxes. So this, this is really a question about the relationship between the presentation that we heard today and Cass's famous work, Nudge, with his co-author, uh, Thaler. I, I do note that um, Thaler got the Nobel Prize largely for, for this co-authored work, and many of us in the legal academy think Cass was robbed, but that's another, uh, that's another issue. Uh, would I understand your, your answer correctly to be that whenever the government judges that the benefits of information disclosure in consumers making what the government perceives to be correct decisions, whenever those benefits of information are greater than the, the costs, that it would be your view that the government either should or could require information disclosure because the, the fact that consumers are not, in fact, willing to pay uh, enough to capture those benefits is an indication that there's got to be either a market failure in not providing the information or a behavioral failure in consumers in not acting on it. Phrase, that's, I phrase it just somewhat differently. I agree with you that there should be an obligation to identify a market failure as a predicate for government intervention in the first place. And you wouldn't want to back out of a benefit cost analysis. Yes, we have a market failure. So step one, what's the market failure? And if the market failure is there's an externality, and let's say we see the fuel economy labels as a way of reducing an externality, which is the environmental consequences of motor vehicles, then we have a market failure. If it's where, if suppose it's uh, a label which is an energy efficiency label, and let's stipulate a lot of the benefits are consumers themselves are saving money, 
then the externality justification doesn't work, and we have to give some explanation, and it has to be, you know, not uh, dogmatic. It has to be earned about why there's a market failure. And so the, the present bias and optimistic bias ideas are uh, speculations. They don't earn the conclusion that there's a market failure. There may not be a market failure. But we, we need to look at the market to see when people are buying refrigerators, are, there, are they thinking about the economic savings of having a fuel efficient refrigerator? And uh, maybe not. And there are theoretical reasons to think maybe not. So it's a long-winded way of saying specify the market failure first if you're government, and then do the cost-benefit analysis. Great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about your, your very uh, provocative um, introduction, uh, the first part of your talk today, where you suggested that many of the uh, issues that we perceive as debates about values uh, are, are, are really uh, generated by the absence of sufficient factual information, if I understood you correctly. Uh, and I, I wanted to uh, urge you to think and perhaps speculate with us a little bit about how we might use some of that perception, with which I, I strongly agree, to deal with some of the dysfunction in our political institutions to today um, as someone who's 70 years old and is, is therefore beyond the ambition of ever serving again in government, um, I can see that one of the thing I can say that one of the things that discourages me about the Congress is how it how it seems to be uh, either a fact-free zone or a zone in which people make up facts or selectively perceive facts to uh, fit their fit their ideologies. Um, how can, we, how can we handle that and specifically, or how can we apply your, your point to help improve political dialogue in the country? And specifically to focus it, um, one of your predecessors uh, at ORIRA, John, John Graham, who is now the Dean of the School of Public Policy uh, at uh, Indiana University, has proposed that maybe Congress needs something like ORIRA. Um, there, there were a number of advisory institutions in the Congress, as I'm sure you know, like the Office of Technology Assessment, that were designed to provide accurate and, and non-biased uh, information to the Congress. And gradually over the years, those, those have all been abolished. Do you, do you think that political dialogue would be improved by, by having uh, information disclosure requirements not simply for consumers, but also for politicians? And I'll tell you why I'm, I'm smiling. I mentioned the mercury rule, which is uh, very expensive rule, um, but with benefits that crush the costs. Uh, when it was proposed, a number of critical comments came in, including from Congress, that were extremely substantive. They said, this part is too expensive and isn't going to get you much environmental gain. This part is going to hit small business hard, and what are you doing? And one member of Congress, I'll make him nameless for the moment, and you'll see why, uh, sent in 14 comments, and this is someone who despised the Obama administration. And the letter was extremely impressive in its substantive detail. I don't know where he got all that stuff. And he made 14 suggestions, and we accepted the majority of them. Uh, not for political reasons, they were convincing on the merits. And I called him up. It's the only time I called up a member of Congress on the day a rule was to be announced. And I said to him, your letter was really good. We did these, you know, let's say 10, and we didn't do four, and I'll explain why we found the four unconvincing. And he said to me on the phone, that, that's amazing. He said, that's fantastic. Uh, I hear you. I'm going to release a, I'm going to do a press release complimenting the rule. He didn't. I, I, I think his staff probably told him, you're crazy. You're, you're not going to do a press release. But he didn't do a press release suggesting the rule was bad. And that was reflective of his substantive engagement. So to the extent that the executive branch is responsive to substantive comments and not responsive to um, political threats and such, that incentivizes the former. I do love the idea of some organization that Congress regularly consults or consults by practice, which is 
um, an honest broker with respect to the likely effects. So there's, there's a rule that the Trump administration also supported, I think on technical grounds, from the Obama administration, which requires all automobiles in the US to have cameras so to reduce back over crashes. And that's uh, a rule which is pretty expensive, but it reduces accidents and deaths, including of very small children killed by their own parents. So it's uh, uh, the uh, valence of the deaths is, uh, uh, what's the right word, is unusual. Uh, the Trump administration went for it. There's a highly technical analysis. I looked, after I left government, I looked into what Congress was thinking when it enacted that law essentially unanimously. And it basically did hardly any due diligence. It got some report that had abstractions in it, and it seems like no one in Congress knew what the report said. So to, before you're gonna mandate the government do something involving you know, reduction of emissions or different practices from FERC or something, to have uh, uh, Congress having a, a repository of knowledge on which it can rely, an excellent idea. Great, thank you. I've got a couple of questions uh, of a somewhat technical nature about willingness to pay, but, but I think it's useful to spend a minute or two on them. Uh, one question is, isn't willingness to pay uh, flawed because some people have more money than others, but basically limited by people's ability to pay? And then the second question, which is related, is isn't it unreliable and how do you determine willingness to pay uh, how, can you, how can you figure out, how can you do a reliable willingness to pay study? Okay, they're both great questions. Uh, if you are um, trying to figure out what people's willingness to pay is, the best way to find out is to see what they're willing to pay. So uh, in markets, we have a ton of information about what people are willing to pay for things. The second best thing to do is to ask them. And if you ask them, you can find out things. It may be that the contingent valuation study either is not good or is flawed in essence, but you learn stuff. And I've actually done willingness to pay studies for this kind of information, and the numbers would strike you, I think, as highly realistic. About half of Americans want calorie information, and they're willing to pay uh, annually about $50 for it. That tells us something. Um, so ask them, and uh, if, if, you do, if you don't have market evidence. The, the fact that willingness to pay is dependent on ability to pay is often taken as an objection to willingness to pay. I think in the first instance, it's a virtue of willingness to pay. If people are asked to pay something for, let's say, a reduction of a small health risk from water, the fact that they're poor should be respected and they should not be forced to pay more than they're willing to pay. If they say a one in 100,000 risk of death from drinking water, I, I, I have children to educate and to, to help. Uh, that, that doesn't bother me. I don't wanna pay a whole lot of money for that. That's, uh, that should be honored rather than said, well, your willingness to pay is low because you don't have much money. Said, then the, the, person, the in discussion I'm imagining person doesn't have a lot of money is saying, that's right. Don't make me pay more money. And that's a way of respecting their autonomy and I think promoting their welfare. If the suggestion is that they should be given more money, I agree with that. But a regulatory imposition that costs more to them than they find worth it is not a way of giving them money. It's a way of giving them a bad deal by their lights. This is not making you all happy. I think, what's I think the reason it's not making you happy, there are two possibilities. One is that I'm wrong, uh, but we're gonna indulge another possibility, which is that, it, it's, it, that we often think of regulation as uh, a way of giving people something that it's good for them to have. And whether it's good for them to have depends on the aggregate effects of it for them. And if they don't have much money to force on them something that is costing them money that they want to spend on something else, it's not good for them. They would rightly say, I think, go away. Let me spend my money on what I see as my priorities, not this tiny health risk. 
So if we want to accompany a regulatory imposition with a subsidy to people who don't have a lot of money, that can be a great idea. So this is a good question about, uh, about peers and peer information. But as kind of a segue to that, um, I've, I've also been a, uh, uh, interest, very interested in providing information to people about what their peers are doing, particularly as a way of motivating moral behavior um, and essentially shaming people. I learned a number of years ago, and this relates to your comments about willingness to pay, that um, when, you, when you ask people how much they recycle, uh, they lie. They systematically <laughs> overestimate the amount that they recycle. Um, but when you ask them how much their neighbor recycles, they actually give you a very accurate estimate uh -huh. of how much they recycle. So a lot of different ways to interpret that, uh, that, that factoid. Uh, one is that they are in fact recycling as much as their neighbor, uh, re as they perceive their neighbor as recycling. So here's the question. Regarding your comments on uh, home reports, letting people know how much energy they use compared to their peer group, why do you think people care? Some people rejoice in consuming more than others. So this is an um, interesting question. Let me just add it a little bit. Uh, you know your predecessor at Harvard Law School, Oliver Wendell Holmes, wrote famously in the common law that we should design laws to deal with the so-called bad person. Um, and I think in some ways peer information is designed at the opposite end to try to motivate the good person to behave more morally. So um, I'll, I'll first ask the, the specific question, what do we do about people who rejoice in consuming more information or consuming more than, uh, than, than we, the great magic elitist we, think that they should? Okay, so the basic data is as you stated, and it's way, a way underused tool. So I'm hoping both practice and theory will be activated on the part of you all. Uh, in the UK, they've done it extremely creatively for reducing social problems, telling people that they're in a small percentage of people who are doing X or their behavior is out of line with the norm. There are two reasons why that might work in the energy context. One is self-interest. People are thinking, I'm losing money compared to my neighbors. I must be stupid. I'm just going to stop being dumb. I'm going to save money. Or they might think, I'm a creep. I'm polluting and I shouldn't be doing that. My guess, though I don't have the data, is that the first is the driver, not the second. And if so, that explains why the overwhelming bulk of the data finds very little rejoicing. So people aren't saying, there's one paper that's been questioned that finds a rejoicing on the part of a segment of the population. I'm consuming more than usual, hooray. But that's not the practice. Uh, and the reason that's consistent with the self-interest, people don't like thinking, I'm spending more money than most people on something that I don't particularly love. You might like that with your automobile or your clothing, but not energy. Doesn't, it's not a status symbol. Uh, and with the people who are rejoicing to the extent that there is such a population, as I say empirically, it's not looking big, uh, there are things that can be done uh, that would uh, fortify the message by saying, uh, compared to your peers, you're losing X amount of dollars every, every month. Or compared to your uh, peers, you're responsible for X amount of pollution every month. And my guess is that, that one or the other would reduce the rejoicing. I, I think, just as a comment on that, I think one of our challenges in, in designing regulatory systems is to get the benefit of moral actions or beyond compliance behavior without undermining the incentives for mandatory behavior because we do have a distribution of sensitivities among, among people uh, as to what extent they're, they're motivated by, by more subtle signals or, or nudges. Um, that was first brought home to me when uh, uh, a client of mine who was the in-house environmental lawyer uh, at 
what was at the time one of the largest polluters in the United States, thanked me for driving a Prius because under the fuel economy standards, it would uh, drive down the pressure on him to drive a, 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 a high mileage car uh, because it was a, because it was a, a fixed uh, limited uh, a pool. Um, so I think that, that does bring home the notion that not everybody is going to be motivated by these uh, more subtle signals. Any event, I have a couple of legal, you're welcome to respond to oh, that if great. you want. Um, I have a couple of more uh, technical uh, questions about um, mandating disclosure. The first, uh, uh, since there are many of us in the room are lawyers, um, the question is, what are your thoughts on the First Amendment challenges to mandating disclosure to, first, to forced speech? Somewhere between OMG and WTF. <laughs> Would you, like to yeah. would you like to elaborate on that answer, that, or shall we just leave uh, it there? Okay. Uh, um, for well over 150 years, it was agreed that the First Amendment didn't protect commercial advertising at all. That was the law of the land. Uh, the notion that I live in a house, by the way, just by serendipity, that was one of the places the British went on April 19, 1775, on the day that started the Revolutionary War. And the uh, Revolutionary War was fought for something, and the First Amendment encapsulates uh, Madison's conception of one of the principles for which it was fought. The notion that commercial advertising is at the heart or a fundamental part of uh, the core of our Bill of Rights is uh, very hard to defend. Uh, to say that truthful uh, commercial advertising to consumers by uh, you know, prescription drugs, as in the Virginia Board of Pharmacy cases protected by the First Amendment, that was a re revolutionary decision. And uh, I think not a not a hateful or ridiculous decision. It had something to do with personal autonomy, which you could connect with the First Amendment. But the notion that in this decade we're going to go hard after the FTC and the SEC or the EPA or the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Interior or the Department of Justice for mandating consumer information, this is uh, Will you know the, the letters? <laughs> I'm going to stand with WTF. OK. <laughs> uh, these are two related uh, uh, questions, I think, which do go maybe to uh, a common theme. Uh, the first is, how do you propose improving population buy-in? I think that's to buy-in to government-mandated information disclosure is how I understand it. And a related question is, is there a concern that the bureaucracy needed to expand information disclosure may outweigh the benefits? Okay, great question. So I have done national surveys, uh, not only in the United States, but in you know, maybe 15 other countries about information disclosure as a regulatory tool. And to my surprise, there's extremely strong majority support across partisan lines. So it's not as if Republicans think calorie labels are a bad idea and Democrats like them. They both like them. So we already have a lot of population buy-in for disclosure as a regulatory tool. And I have uh, data from the United States where mandates and, and uh, tax incentives run into popular concern when disclosure doesn't. So, so we already have widespread acceptance. Um, if we want to promote buy-in, I think the best way to get buy-in to, to, is to earn it and just be truthful about what it's for and what it can do. So to say to people, you know, ta the fuel economy label is going to help you save money. And uh, uh, are you for seeing it or is it a bother? And people tend to like it in large numbers. Second question was? It was related to oh, the bureaucracy. cost of the bureaucracy. Yeah, the, the, if you look at the, the, our, our new one from the Department of Agriculture is the proposal for GMO labeling, which has an environmental component. Um, 
that the cost of genetically that, modified organisms. For yeah. Those of you. yeah, it wasn't one of those other kind of acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing. Young people. Those were or, more entertaining. Nothing, no chance, nothing. Really. Uh, uh, GM, genetically modified organisms, and the idea is so the consumers can see. The government's now using the word bioengineered foods. It's a costly regulation. I personally am very. Um, uh, negative about the regulation. I don't think it's a good idea. But the real cost comes from private sector. The bureaucracy that is behind the Department of Agriculture's initiative, which is required by statute, it, it's, it's uh, a drop in the bucket compared to those hundreds of millions or $3 billion. So information disclosure as a regulatory tool is usually not maximally demanding in terms of bureaucratic efforts though it may be more costly than you think in terms of private sector burdens. So how much information disclosure is enough and how much is, is too much? Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, there's criticism, uh, including of the GMO regulation, on the grounds that by, by government mandating information disclosure, it's implicitly telling people this is a significant difference and you, you really ought to pay attention to it. And a kind of a related objection is the literature that argues that if, if too much is disclosed, people essentially suffer from information overload and they don't take the disclosures as seriously. The example uh, that's often given is Proposition 65 in, in California which discloses so many substances as known to the state of California to cause cancer that, that many people make jokes about it. So how much information disclosure is enough? How much is too much? And how should we be selective? OK, so th in the United Kingdom, there's a behavioral insights team. And their mantra is test, test, test. And the idea is that uh, there's no abstract question or off the rack answer to questions like that test. And if sometimes it's easy to test with relatively small groups, you learn things. Sometimes there's kind of off the rack knowledge, which is highly likely to be right. So when people buy a car, they're not presented, at least with respect to fuel economy, with a ton of information. They're given a bits, and it's easily processed. Um, with respect to mortgage disclosures, there's good reason to think, if anyone here has recently bought a house, that the volume is, is so high that it's not likely to be useful. So to, to keep it simple and straightforward and to make it salient and uh, fitting with intuition is a good idea. There's, there's, so if any of you who's involved in information disclosure strategies, the best book on website design has a brilliant title. It's uh, Don't Make Me Think. The second edition is not quite as good. Its title is called Don't Make Me Think Revisited. <laughs> but the, uh, the idea behind the book is that for website design, you want things to be um, automatic. And so that people aren't even aware that the thing is uh, uh, forcing them to do stuff or leading them to do stuff. Uh, they're just absorbing what they need to. And for busy people, that's often a mercy just to give people information that's intuitive. So here's another way to put it. Steve Jobs. One of the many reasons he was a genius is that he made Apple completely fit with people's intuitions. And if you look at some of the government's information disclosures, Steve Jobs would applaud, and others he would not. And it, for those who are seeking guidance to think, is it like an Apple computer, really, is a good rule of thumb. Great. Oh, this will have to be our last question. And it, it starts rather narrowly, but it does broaden out at the end. So um, while you were ORIRA administrator, EPA submitted a willingness to pay study on reducing fish loss at power plant cooling systems. The interim report was published. The final willingness to pay results were never released. That's the narrow part. Uh, EPA did Good all it question. could to produce a willingness to pay study that met all best practice standards. Does this suggest that willingness to pay for environmental is not really possible? So I take the question to be more broadly, how practical is it really to do this? Okay, so uh, there's market data 
which we often have for things, how much people are willing to pay for things. If we don't have market data, people are increasingly in a position to do randomized controlled trials, which are a lot like market data, where you can see how much people are willing to pay for things. Uh, if you don't have either of those to ask them is a way to compile information that's relevant. For GMOs, the government referred to the data, good, and it also said we don't really trust the data, good, because the data can't be trusted. It's too hypothetical. The surveys aren't great yet. So the use of contingent valuation or hypothetical valuation is authorized by OMB guidelines, but it has to be highly professional. So th this is a way of saying, yes, it is practical to try to generate numbers through market evidence or otherwise. Uh, let me ask all of you to join me in thanking Cass for very stimulating. Okay.